Hi all and welcome back to episode 2 of the Blair White podcast today. I know this is a new style of video you're seeing uh, from the last video now into this one. And I understand if some people maybe don't prefer it as much as they do the previous videos. But unfortunately the previous videos don't have much merit at the moment with not much to preview. So we're going to go into this podcast style. As always, as I said in the previous video, do get in touch if you want to come on. And on today's episode, and on the line today, is Adam Sharkey, who has a deep uh, racing background, with his granddad being the owner of the great Harchibald, and also uh, a horse called Nicanor, who beat Denman in the 2006 Sun Alliance or the Cheltenham Festival. He could have been an excellent horse as well. So if you're new to the channel and you do enjoy the video, please do give it a like and subscribe down below, and hopefully you guys enjoy this episode. It's a bit shorter than the last one. And I'll see you guys uh, in a bit. Okay, so a new episode today of the Blair White podcast. And we are opening it up to everybody. And we've got a great young man on the line in Adam Sharkey. How are you, Adam? And how's lockdown treating you? Jeez, I'm not well, too well, actually, to be honest with you, Andrew. I'm losing the marbles with no racing. Losing the will to live, nearly. Um, hopefully we get back in action soon. First of June, Royal Ascot, I think, I think that's the date. It's even money at the moment on the Betfair exchange, but I think it should go ahead, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think it's pretty important that this flat season does take place in some degree, even if it is behind closed doors to start off. I suppose, though, you might want to let us know how you got into racing and I suppose how has that kind of grown to, to being a, a fairly regular attendee up at Leopardstown? Yeah, I only got the bug in the last five years, really, but since I was, I'd say, str straight out of the womb, to be honest, when I was in the womb, I was listening to the races because my dad was mad into it. Um, the, back then, my granddad, his dad, had a lot of horses, Harchibald, um, the most famous by miles. Um, so he used to go across England to all the tracks, and he really gave me the book, yeah. But I, I was going to Cheltenham since I was about five. I've been every year since I was about five. But I only really, do you know when you're really into racing, there's some people that like going for a few points, a few bets. But the first thing I do when I wake up now is check racing posts. That's the type of, when you're really into racing. But, yeah, we, my dad had some great days with Archibald. I think the, the first racing memory for me that I can really remember is, 2000, this is a long time ago, it's about 15 years ago. I went to Kempton for the Christmas hurdle in 2005. Have you seen that race? Rooster yeah. Booster. Rooster, Rooster Rooster goes up 20 lengths in front. Yeah, 20 lengths clear, and you're getting in ITV, or no, it wasn't I, Channel 4 back then even. You're getting in running prices. Hartree Balls drifted to 7 to 4, 5 to 2, 5 to 1. And you, I've never, Rooster was about 60 lengths clear with about six furlongs to go, and you're thinking, geez, he's going to do well from here. And you just, Hartree Ball slowly but surely. If, if anyone here now watching this hasn't seen this race, 2005 Christmas Hurdle at Kempton. I don't, I don't think, I know I'm a bit biased now, but I don't think I've seen a race like it. Um, yeah, it was an exceptional turn of foot. And I suppose Paul Carberry was exactly the, the type uh, of man he did on a, on a horse like Archibald. Yeah, silky hands. A lot of debates come over the years, that famous champion hurdle, did he leave him too much to do? I'm not sure, to be honest. If you ask any of the jockeys, AP, Ruby Walsh, I've asked a few of them at previews before, do you think if you rode Archibald in that champion or you would have won? And they all said no. He was he was a bit of a rogue. He couldn't you couldn't get him to the front too early, or he'd be in serious trouble. Um I I've never personally seen a horse take a tug after the last in a champion hurdle or in any race at Cheltenham. It's nearly one of those places they always give them an extra smack. But I I think that that's the two times I've seen my dad cry. The day Archibald got beaten in the champion hurdle and the day his mom died. So that's yeah. just that 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 that, that, that hits home of what what it meant, but um, yeah, just had some very lucky owner. His granddad, well, my granddad, his dad. He had Nick and Nora as well. Um, beat Denman in the Neptune Fair and Square. Uh, Dem was this unbeatable yoke at that time. I think he was going eleven in a row or something. And Nick and Nora beat him four lengths, easy enough. I I another biased opinion. I thought he was. He, Everyone like no me thought he was better than Denman. Got injured, went chasing next year, got injured. But over hurdles, he was better than him. Beat him fair and square in the Neptune. I think it was the Sun Alliance back then. It was called. Um, you know, very lucky owner. Uh, yeah, long, long family history in the game. So, I've, I'll hopefully if I 
I'm a successful businessman in the future. I'd love to have a few horses, but it's getting more and more expensive with the monopolies of Jiggins Town, Rich Richie's JP. It's really impossible for a small average punter to get into the game at this stage. Yeah, exactly. I suppose, in a way, syndicates do help out that sort of thing. I know some of your mates are in the, in the uh, Black Rock Racing Syndicate and they've had a, a couple of decent days with Arthurian fame uh, at Leopardstown. I know you're a regular at Leopardstown. Um, there have a lot of new facilities coming into place, which I, for one, am very happy about because it's looked fairly old for quite a long time now. Uh, what, I suppose, what are your thoughts? Uh, you're a fellow member like myself, kind of, of the say, the members' experience when you're attending Leopardstown? Yeah, no, Leopardstown is de definitely my favourite track. It's my local track. It's about a mile from my house. You, the one thing about it, you can't. I live so close, but you can't walk the track. A van sort of thing goes around and making sure you can. So these days when you're going for a run, I'd love to run around Leopardstown racetrack and see the undulations and stuff. Just feel like a horse nearly. It gets you over the five. If I was doing the 5K run, I'd do it around there in record time. But... Uh, no, I do. I, I love Leopardstown. That's when I die, I'd like to have my ashes buried in Leopardstown nearly. It's probably my favorite place in the world after Cheltenham, of course. Um but no, yeah, the facilities they're putting in there, it's looked very old, yeah, for a long time. I don't think they've made change, much change since the eighties. Um yeah, no, to come up to sta the current to come up to the current standard would be good, but it just costs so much money. And today I don't think there's that much money in Irish racing. To be honest with you, you can see with the attendances, a lot of people sit at home with their Betfair up and watch it on at the races or racing TV now. And attendances, uh, my dad would used to tell me 20 years ago, if you went into the betting ring at somewhere like Leopardstown on a Christmas meeting, be packed shoulder to shoulder. But now people are, I, I'm guilty myself, backing online and it's just killing the income of race courses. So, yeah, I, I do love Leopardstown, but I'm not sure who's going to invest that much money and it'd have to be charitable donations from wealthy people because i can't see any other way they're going to get the money yeah i would have to agree and i suppose one thing you've hit the nail on the head there is is kind of the attendances i'm always shocked people our age really there doesn't seem to be almost any type of interest in racing apart from maybe stephen's day or, or college students day or something like that but when you go over to the likes of a cheltenham like i've been to cheltenham at even the november meeting and it's an event that kind of everyone of every age, both male and female, want to be at. As for you, come to Leopardstown at Christmas. And yes, some people might go at Stephen's Day, but they pack themselves into the tent and don't even watch the races. No, yeah, some people thrill up as a booze up, which is fine because it's bringing money to the race courses. But I've always thought, I've been to loads of meetings around the world. I've been to Dubai five or six times, Dubai World Cup. I've been to Ascot, York, uh, Kempton, all of them. Cheltenham, Aintree. Um, but the one thing I've noticed about English racing is they seem to do it a lot better, a lot more professional. Maybe it's because they've got more money pumped in from the TV channels or whatever, but they do it a lot more professionally. It just seems a bit amateur in Ireland. It's not as well organised. There's no, there's not much advertisement even going around. I know they've started an RT or something. If you're watching, you'll see it, a racing, horse racing Ireland ad or something. Because the one topic I'd like to get into is the Curra. What an absolute disaster that place has been. Mm. I went down there a few nights during the summer on a Friday night. They did that Friday night racing. I think they're going to stop it. But honestly, about 150 people there. Um, they'll, they'll still charge you 20, 25 to get in. And there's no real way down. There's no, I suppose there's a train goes to Nace, but it's got still a taxi. And oh, gee, even for the, I remember the Derby there last year during the summer, some gobshite let off, set off the smoke alarm when they were going into the stalls, I think. So they had to delay the Derby. But even at the Derby, the attendance are down to 50% of what they were 20 years ago, which is it's worrying times for Irish racing, especially when you look at Punches 10 this year being cancelled. A lot of people that work for Punches 10 Racecourse, they're dependent on that week at the start of May going ahead. I don't know how horse racing aren't going to afford to pay these staff because there's no money in Irish racing, really, to be honest. No, I think they're, they're going to have to... Hope for for a bit of bailout from the, the government in that sort of um, regard. I, I have to agree with you. I remember going down to the Curra while it was still in construction uh, for a meeting. And I've, I just kind of couldn't believe how 
desolate the place was. You were walking in and there was five different parade rings with, you know, no horses getting to the, the main parade ring. And then you get to the main parade ring and it turns out they didn't measure it correctly, that horses couldn't fit in it, you know, <laughs> for big field handicaps. So, like, I don't know who's making these decisions, but the Curra had to be done in a way to really attract people. And as you say, you've done all your construction, you've spent an awful lot of money, and you're not getting the crowds. No. Yeah. And I'd say you're th- John Magner, Jay Buick Manis, these type of people are looking, they've invested probably donations of five million to build the, these facilities. And I think the, the ex-managing director or whatever of um, the Curra race, I think he's gone now on gardening leave, whatever that means. Um, but Pacquiao, he, he, he's the man, I think, for the job. He's done a great job with Leopardstown. Compared to all the other Irish race courses, Leopardstown gets a huge attendance. Um, yeah, he's probably the man for the job. But I think he's he'll have a lot to do because the attendance that I think they could be in serious trouble in the car at the amount of they're they're literally they're living off wealthy people's donations and that's a worrying thing to be doing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, going into hopefully having a some sort of flat season when when we get out of these uh, restrictions, I suppose. It's up in the air what we whether the guineas will take place. If so, when the derby itself and stuff like that. But maybe, do you have any sort of O'Brien horses, any horses in general that you're, you're looking forward to in the flat season when it comes about? Yeah, well, I, I went actually down to Coolmore last month on a on a trip with the Trinity Horse Racing side, even though I'm not in Trinity. But uh, no, yeah. The, some of the two-year-olds haven't been named and everything. Last year, they were really disappointed with how the two-year-olds ran. So I, I'm going to... They're always underpriced as well, those O'Brien two-year-olds. They go off one to three just on merit and breeding. And I'd nearly stay clear of them until they have a few runs into them. But on, on to the classics, yeah, Pinatubo. Imagine he, he could have done the triple crown nearly if he went for the 2000 guineas, the derby, then if he could possibly stay the ledger... But no, that would have been amazing. I think he's the one to follow Pinatubo. I think he's the most exciting two-year-old since I've been really into racing. He's the most exciting two-year-old I've ever seen. The, the the one day I've seen a bit of atmosphere was when he won by 10 lengths in the Curra. That's one day I saw. There was actually a good few English over for that. Um, and it'd be great if he came back over to race and maybe Champions Weekend or something in Ireland and the champion stakes. But yeah, I have a good bet in Pinatubo, 7-1 to one to go unbeaten this flat season. Only has to run twice. I think you're, if he stays at a mile to mile two, he's, you're buying money. I think at that. <laughs> this Pinatubo, Jesus, that, that, uh, especially that run in the Curra, because that was a good field, probably O'Brien's best two year old yeah. running in that. Yeah. And put them away by, by 10 lengths. And as you say, it's something that I think is underestimated even in the Dublin Racing Festival. Irish people, like if, an, if a good English horse comes over and wins a big race, Irish people have no issue with it. In fact, they do welcome you know, a, a, a successful raid, if you want to call it like that. Um, I remember Labago Wa winning at one of the Dublin Racing Festivals. Warren, and, Warren Gray tricks, yeah. Was yeah, and she, and she got a massive reception. So I just, it seems to be more frequent on the flat that English trainers are, are coming over to Ireland and exploiting the, the prize money and, and the opportunities. Yeah, it's there is an issue, I think, at the timing of... Dublin Racing Festival because the, the prize money is brilliant but I, I remember my dad was over in Cheltenham was talking to Nicky Henderson a few weeks ago and Nicky Henderson said uh, my dad said would you not come over for whatever the Dublin Racing Festival the prize money is brilliant and he looks at him and says my owners don't care about the prize money they all want Cheltenham so everything's building towards Cheltenham over there no matter how big the prize money it's just impossible to attract them over three weeks before Cheltenham I suppose from Cheltenham itself I know you were over there obviously a couple of weeks ago what would be your main takeaways from that those four days in terms of horses that you were you were oh, all over or or whatever? There's there's one image in my head I struggle to get out when I when I try and sleep I see Jamie Moore falling off Goshen I think that Goshen yoke is oh, a fucking airplane I saw I saw him taking off at Heathrow Airport there a few weeks ago I think um if he can run in the Ebor at York. On flat out, oh, geez, I think I have my biggest bet ever on him to win the Ebor. I think he's a machine to go that gallop he went up front and just to stay there. All mankind, he you saw how he faded. The winner, burning victory, came from miles back. But Goshen, I think he, I think he's if he runs the champion hurdle, I think he'll win it barring a fall because he can barely jump. 
But I think the engine of him, he'll definitely win the champion Ireland if he can stay up. So I think if you want, if you want one for the flat season, it's definitely Goshen if he runs in the e board. Because what what you have winning that last year, who won that Moose year or something for Jer Lines? Jeez, imagine a Goshen would eat him alive, wouldn't he? No. Yeah, exactly. And I think he's off a mark of only 88 or something on the flat. Like, oh, he, he could, he could genuinely guess, have two stone in hand. Like, you could nearly see him going off or something six to four or something for the e yeah, board. I suppose to, to finish up, you've named Goshen as, as a flat horse and a champion hurdle horse to follow. If you were to give me maybe two more for, for Cheltenham next year, who, who would they be and why? I, this one's a bit controversial. I think Gypsy Island, if Gypsy Island, I think would have beat Envoy Allen in the champion bumper, to be honest with you. Um, absolute rock solid form. And on, it was, on, it was a, I think it was three or four going over hurdles. Had one run over hurdles, so wasn't allowed run the champion bumper in England. The rules are different. You're not allowed running bumpers in England if you've ran over hurdles um, before. Yeah. But um, no, yeah. Gypsy Island, if you look at his form, even that, do you know who he lost in his for in his only hurdle run? Put the kettle on who came and won the Arca. So I think, honest, I think Gypsy Island's a real a force to be reckoned with next year. I think as good as Envoy Allen, if not better. And that's controversial, but I think very highly of her. And I know Peter Fahey does as well. Um, another Bally Adam looked a machine. At, I think what Jamie Codd said, that's the best horse that will ever run at Dan Patrick after he won his bumper, which is probably true. Um, yeah, a Bally Adam for the Neptune. I think he's twenties at the moment. I think you could, if you're back, if you had fifty on Bally Adam, fifty on Fernie Hollow. I think you've got the winner out of those two. For if they, if one of them turns up for the Neptune, which is good value at twenties or sixteens. Walt Connick, did you see that? He, Walt Connick, half brother to Walt Geist, won at Wolverhampton in December. He he could be a good horse for the summer on the flat. Um, but no, just pin a tube out for the flat. And then Bally Adam, G- Gypsy Island, follow all, all the way next year now. Gypsy Island, every race I'll be watching. <laughs> um, now, I'm a big fan of the work you do, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Um, hopefully, I'll see you up for a few points on the Thursday nights once Leprosan gets going again. Yeah, exactly. I can, I can see it in the distance there. Oh, it might have been on a, on a sunny Thursday, actually, at the moment. Tonight, we'd be, yeah, we'd be, near, we'd be getting dressed now, ready to go up. Oh, Jesus, how times have tra- changed. Yeah, exactly. But great to have you on, Adam, and uh, so, some some great views there. And hopefully, see you soon and uh, stay safe. And that concludes episode two of the Blair White podcast. I really hope you enjoyed my chat there with Adam. I thought it was a very interesting chat about some of his memories from obviously family owned horses and then going into the likes of youth racing here in Ireland today. And obviously, he has high hopes for Goshen going into next season. If you did enjoy it, please do give it a like subscribe down below and if you want to be involved in one of these podcasts give me a shout on instagram or twitter links are in the description and until next time which will be episode three i hope you guys stay safe stay lucky and be well